Good morning, everybody. How are we doing today? Yeah? Yeah? Do we need to bring the coffee in? I'm thinking maybe some coffee for you this morning, huh? It's so good to see everybody here. I've met many people for the first time today, so we're delighted that you're here with us, and we hope that you'll come back and check us out again and join us, and it's just good to see all the familiar faces that are here, and I know I can't see you online, but we're always so grateful that we have this opportunity for people who can't be here physically with us to join us online, and, and as Dee said, hopefully at some point you'll be able to come in and be here in the community. So... Um, we are starting this week a, a small group series based on the book by Brene Brown called Braving the Wilderness. Now, Brene is a research pro professor at the University of Houston, and she's written numerous best-selling books. How many of us have read any of Brene's books? Yeah, they've been just absolutely amazing. Now, normally in a series like this, uh, because it is a seven-week series, I'll, I would do a talk every week that has to do with that particular chapter. I think in this series I'm going to be um, doing... Uh, the talks in a shorter period of time, but the small groups will still go on as usual uh, throughout the seven weeks. And if you have not signed up for a small group, you still have that opportunity today to do so. And I'd want to put a plug in for this because if you want to build your community of like-minded people, getting into a small group is a beautiful way of doing that. Uh, and, you know, in a small group, you meet at somebody's house or church or library or whatever. You go through the series together, and you just create these wonderful bonds with people. And I don't know about you, but I really love my relationships, um, especially with people who are like-minded, yes? And we're going to talk today about expanding beyond just being comfortable uh, just with each other and, and uh, getting more comfortable with people who aren't like us. Oh, that's a big one, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Um, so this particular book was written in 2017 uh, when we were experiencing some pretty crazy division. Do you guys remember that? Oh, wait. It's still happening today, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, that is why. Um, we chose this book because this book really speaks to what this division is causing. And it also gives us tools to help us navigate uh, these next weeks as we lead up to the election. Um, but even beyond, that gives us tools on how we can move into um, a deeper connection, again, with people who aren't necessarily like-minded. Right? Right? Yeah, how, how we can do that. And I know I saw the faces like, oh, yeah, okay. Um, so some themes in this book have to do with belonging versus fitting in, uh, being authentically you, and this is a, our mission statement, to be all that we came here, to be authentically all that we came here to be as individuated expressions of God. Um, there's a theme that talks about loneliness, about being brave, of course, about spirituality and the importance of true connection. So since the title of the talk is Braving the Wilderness, I want to talk first a little bit about the wilderness. Now, in the Bible, the wilderness is a place of intense experience, but where God's presence is felt. And that's one of the things that we really want to hone into here is that, you know, is, is that we always have that opportunity to really feel the, the presence of that which we call God. The wilderness is talked about over 300 times in the Bible. And so some of the people who had wilderness experiences, uh, God spoke to Abraham in the wilderness. God brought the Israelites into the wilderness, took them to Mount Sinai, where they spent 40 years in the wilderness. And so the 40 years represents a couple things, as long as it takes, and sometimes it's a really long wilderness experience, right? Yeah, um, which prepared them then to um, inherit the land that God had promised them. God met with Moses in the wilderness through the burning bush. Um, Elijah had an encounter with God in the wilderness, and God became known as the voice calling in the wilderness. Joseph's wilderness experience prepared him to be second in command in Egypt, and of course we all know that Jesus fasted in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. The story is that he was tempted by, quote-unquote, the devil, um, but really that story is 
about that God's grace is always there in every experience uh, that we have. So how many of us have had wilderness experiences in our lives? <laughs> and not just one, right? But we've had wilderness experiences. So the wilderness can represent a place um, that is an experience of isolation and danger. Um, it can feel kind of scary and kind of daunting, right? We've had those wilderness experiences. But the wilderness can also represent renewal and a deepening awareness of the ever-presence of God in our lives. And I think for me, that really is what the wilderness experience comes to mean, is that it always is an opportunity for renewal. It's always an opportunity for rising up, but it's always an opportunity for surrender and the recognition that that which we call God is there no matter what. Even when we sometimes feel, because sometimes when you're the wilderness experience, you don't really feel that presence, do you? I mean, I know when I was in some of my deepest wilderness experiences, especially that, that experience of, of deep grief, of the loss of someone, it was really hard for me in those moments to experience God because that pain was so deep. But I know beyond a shadow of a doubt it was that, that presence of God that brought me up and out and ultimately through that wilderness experience. The wilderness experience um, that we have in life can also give us the opportunity to dig deeper and discover aspects of ourselves we didn't necessarily know that we had. You know, in a wilderness experience, we're probably going to discover that we have some gifts and talents and abilities that we didn't even know that we had. Again, because we had to dig in, right? We had to discover these gifts within ourselves. The wilderness experience also gives us the opportunity to dive into who and what we really are and from a deeply spiritual perspective and to bring that forth more in our daily lives. And to me, you know, when I sit sometimes, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I love to go out and sit out back on our deck and the beautiful trees and everything. And every so often I'm like, well, what is the purpose of life? I, do you guys ever ask that question? Like, what is the purpose of life? What is the purpose? And always what comes for me is just to be the best expression of love and light that I can be in this world. I mean, I see no greater purpose than to be that. Isn't that what we truly want to do is we want to bring more of that light and love into the world around us? Do we believe what we talk about here in unity that God is love, God as love is the ever givingness of itself, that love has the potential to really change the dynamics of everything around us? Or do we really believe that? So then we have to start living from that, right? Living more from that. Um, you know, our country and countries around us are definitely exp experiencing the wilderness, right? Yeah, absolutely. And right now the wilderness can seem pretty daunting and pretty scary, scary. But what I know from my personal experience, what I know from things that you all have shared with me, what I know from what scripture tells us or what mythology tells us is that there's always light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> there's always light at the end of the tunnel, that we will get to our promised land. Charles Fillmore, our co-founder, says, when there wells up in a man a great desire to be free from the bondage of ignorance and the animal propensities, his journey to the promised land begins. To me, that's saying, when I'm ready to rise up out of my small ego, or maybe the big ego, whatever it is. And again, I'm ready to recognize the presence of God, the presence of love, the presence of good, the presence of light, and my ability to be that more in the world around me. That is when I am then being led to my promised land. And when we, you know, and, and you know, the promised land is what thought of as the, the land of milk and honey. It's a more joyful experience of life. Do we want a more joyful experience of life? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so because we are diving deeper into spirituality, um, let's look at the definition that Brene Brown gives of the word spirituality in her book, um, The Gifts of Inf 
perfection, which arose out of um, the data research that she did in 2010. Uh, here, spirituality is recognizing and celebrating that we are all inextricably connected to each other by a power greater than ourselves, and that our connection to that power and to one another is grounded in love and compassion. Now we get this, right? From a like from our intellect, we get it. We were talking today in class about there's a difference between the intellect and wisdom. And and the intellect is going to tell us, yeah, this is what it is, but when we move into wisdom, we start living from that. We are all inextricably inextricably connected. And I love where it talks about grounded in what? Love and compassion. Now, I think that uh, we can all agree that these are two qualities that are kind of missing in our political climate today, right? Love and compassion. And my friends, we can't dig our heels in and look and say, well, it's the other group. They need to change. That's not what today's about. That's not what this series is about. Where does it always come back to? It always comes back here, right? Yeah, okay. No, not all of you did that, so it's not, your stuff isn't coming back to me. <laughs> it comes back to ourselves. So, um, so there is a different way um, that we can be present in this political uh, arena that we're in today, but we have to all take responsibility for our part in this, um, this great divide. So through the, this week and through the next weeks, my hope is that we can find our way back to our true connection uh, with each other through love and compassion. So Brene starts by talking about this quote from Maya Angelou, which Maya, um, Maya actually talked about unity, which I think is so cool. She says, you are only free when you realize that you belong no place, you belong every place, no place at all. The price is high, and the reward is great. Wow. That's an interesting quote, isn't it? And Brene shares that it, this really made her mad when she read this quote because she loves Maya Angelou. And, and the reason that it made her so mad was because as Brene was growing up, she never felt like she belonged anywhere. She didn't feel like she belonged in school. She had some experiences where, where she was kind of outcast. She didn't feel like she belonged in her family. And so for Maya to kind of just say, you know, you belong every place, but you belong no place at all, was really hard for her because her whole life became about the need to belong. The need to belong, to feel like she belonged somewhere. Um, but what Brene talked about, and I think that many of us are going to be able to relate to this, that what she experienced in life was not so much a sense of belonging, but doing whatever she needed to do to fit in. Anybody relate to that at all? Growing up in school? But she said she realized that fitting in meant that she wasn't being her authentic self. And again, most people that I've talked to have had experiences similar to that, whether it was in their school, in their families, in their neighborhoods, in their church community. Um, you know, there's, there's the popular kids, the cool kids, the weird kids, the nerds, the geeks. You know, we have all kinds of kids, right, when we're growing up. And kids can be cruel, right? I mean, that's just a reality, and I'm sad to say that's still a reality today. Nationally, one out of five students between the ages of 12 and 18 are bullied um, every year in school, and that doesn't even include online, the bullying that goes on um, online. You know, for myself, I hung out with all different kinds of kids, but my experience was that I never felt like I belonged. And here's the thing about that. It had nothing to do with the environment. It had nothing to do with the kids that I hung out with. It had everything to do with what was going on inside of me. It had everything to do with my lack of self-worth and with my lack of self-value. And Brene shares that sometimes the most dangerous things for kids 
is the silence because my parents didn't have the tools to talk about these kinds of things. We didn't sit down and talk about, hey, how are things going at school right now? How are, how are the kids treating? We didn't have, they didn't have those tools back then. And she says the most dangerous for kids thing for kids sometimes is the silence that allows them to construct their own stories. And what stories do we tend to construct when we feel like we don't belong? We tend to construct stories that tell us that we're unworthy of love and belonging. And this is so important for us because, my friends, whether we realize it or not, we carry this forward into our lives. And it's, it's, it's when we're willing to dig, dig deep, and, to, and that's why I say we have, to, we have to take responsibility for what we are adding to this divide because many times, without even realizing it, we ourselves are acting out of that old woundedness. We're acting out of that old place where we didn't feel like we, we fit in or we didn't feel like we belonged, where we carried forth those, that sense of uh, feeling unworthy and that we don't deserve to belong. But our great teacher, Jesus, he was the epitome of love and belonging. He ministered to the outcasts. He ministered to the lepers and to the poor people, the sick, the quote-unquote sinners. His message was one of what? Of oneness, right? You know, he essentially was saying, without saying it, you're not better because you have power. You're not better because you have money and worldly things. You're not even better if you are a person of the cloth. His message was that we all matter. Every single one of us matters. Every single one of us is valuable. Every single one of us deserves love. Every single one of us deserves to belong. Yes, every single one of us. So Brene says that the feeling of not belonging produces three outcomes. Again, this is from her research. Number one, you live in constant pain and seek relief by numbing it and or inflicting it on others. When you feel that you don't belong anywhere, these are some of the things that are going to show up. Number two, you deny your pain and your denial ensures that you pass it on to those around you or down to your children. And number three, you find the courage to own the pain and develop a level of empathy and compassion for yourself and others that allows you to spot hurt in the world in a unique way. Number three is where we want to get, where we're willing to, to own the pain that we experienced. And, and how many of us can say when we've gone through really hard situations in our lives, isn't it true that we do develop this deep empathy and compassion for other people who then experience that same thing later in life, right? Right. And so we want to get to that place where we can recognize that when somebody's acting out in a negative way, guess what they're acting out of? They're acting out of their own pain. They're acting out of their own, their own woundedness. And can we show up in love with love and compassion? even in those times. So here's what she says about belonging. And this is where we're going to focus today. Belonging is the innate human desire to be a part of something larger than us. Now I'm going to stop here for just a second because let's look at what has happened down south in the last few weeks. And let's look at how we come together because there's something greater than us that is occurring, right? We no longer see differences in each other, do we? We no longer care about differences in each other, do we? We don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat or an Independent or whatever. None of that matters, right? Because all of that drops away because then our true self is what is showing up, that love and compassion. We like to be a part of something bigger and when we can get in there and help in whatever way that we can and look at how the help is showing up. She says, because this yearning is so primal, we often try to acquire it by fitting in and by seeking approval, which are not only hollow substitutes for belonging, but often barriers to it. Have you ever had that person in your life that wants so bad to be a part of your friend group or your whatever that they're irritating? <laughs> because they're trying too hard. 
Yeah, and, and because why? They just want to belong. Because the true belonging only happens when we present our authentic, imperfect selves to the world. What? Our sense of belonging can never be greater than our level of self-acceptance. When we are willing to show up and say, this is who I am. All of it. I cuss. Did you guys? She, <laughs> we were cracking up the other day. I got really frustrated at, at, at a Lego I was putting together. I love to put Legos together. And I got mad at the Lego, and I cussed at it. And Paul cracked up, and he said, if only people at church could see you right now. Here I am. We are not perfect from the sense of we're always going to show up the way that people think that we should show up. It's okay. And that is that vulnerability to be able to be real and honest and say, this is who I am. I want to be better. I don't care that I cuss. I just want to tell you, so I'm good with that. Um, <laughs> you're probably not going to hear me cuss much, but... Um, <laughs> But, you know, but that we, we still want to be a, a more brilliant expression of light and love. I still want to be that. But how can we just be more genuine and authentic with each other? For me, that's one of the things that has been so important in my journey as the spiritual leader is to say, here I am, you guys. And I struggle with this and I've struggled with that. And I crashed on this and I did great on this because I'm no better than anybody else here because I'm the spiritual leader. I just happen to have the gift of gab. <laughs> I can talk about these principles, but I'm just like everybody else. And we're all, I love this story and I'm not going to totally share right now, but there's a story about that we're all bozos on the bus, you know, and I'll share that maybe next week or something, but it's like, we're all in this together and nobody is doing it, quote unquote, perfectly. So she shares that this definition has stood the test of time, but it's incomplete because there's so much more to true belonging. Being ourselves sometimes means we have to have the courage to stand alone, totally alone. And this is what is like this kind of oxymoron is in belonging. We want to belong to each other. And yet the very first thing in this journey is belonging to ourselves and recognizing that even in the sense of belonging to the greater group, I may have to stand out and stand alone and say, oh, I don't agree with that. This is how our board works effectively is when one of us is willing to say, hmm, I don't agree with that when everybody else feels the same way. That's how it works effectively. And, that, and that's scary, isn't it, sometimes, when you're the only one saying it. Um, she says that even as I wrote this, I still thought of belonging as requiring something external to us, something we're secured by, yes, showing up in a real way, but needing an experience that involved others. Others, But as she dug deeper into true belonging, it became clear that it's not something we achieve or accomplish with others. It's something we carry in our own heart. Once we belong thoroughly to ourselves and believe thoroughly in ourselves, true belonging is ours. And I look again at our great teacher, Jesus. He belonged completely to himself, right? He was so rooted in his knowing that he didn't sway from that. He belonged to himself. She says, belonging to ourselves means being called to stand alone, to brave the wilderness of uncertainty, vulnerability, <gasps> and criticism. Oh, my gosh. What? And with the world feeling like a political and ideological combat zone, this is remarkably tough. We seem to have forgotten that even when we're utterly, utterly alone, we're connected to one another by something greater than group membership, politics, and ideology, that we're connected by love and the human spirit. No matter how separated we are by what we think and believe, we are part of the same spiritual story. And then she says, true belonging is the spiritual practice of believing in and belonging to yourself so deeply that you can share your most authentic self with the world and find sacredness in both being a part of something and standing alone in the wilderness. True belonging doesn't require you to change who you are. It requires you to be who you are. 
And, you know, when I look at this, recognize as we talk about this that belonging to ourselves and being able to be present to others who are unlike us never means that we become a doormat. It doesn't mean that we give up our values in order to be present, but it does mean that when I when I know who I am and what I'm about, and yet I can remain open, that I can be present to others who are unlike me from a more peaceful place. And that's really what we kind of need to get to, don't you think? Instead of this combating all the time, making each other wrong. So how does this show up for us to, in today's political climate? Well, she says we're going to need to intentionally be with people who are different from us. We're going to have to sign up, join, and take a seat at the table. And we're going to have to learn how to listen. And my favorite definition of listening is listen with the willingness to be changed by what you hear. What? You mean I'm not listening all the while thinking of what my response is going to be in order to show you that I'm right? No, true listening is being present, really being present, with a willingness to be changed. How many times, oh, and I would go back to our board. I can't tell you how many times I've gone onto a board meeting and I'm just sure about where I'm at on something. And then we have a conversation, somebody else who's brave says this, 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 and all of a sudden I go, I hadn't thought of it from that perspective. Thank you for sharing that. And I've changed my mind. So we want to listen with a willingness to be changed by what we hear. She says we're going to have to have hard conversations, look for joy, share pain, and be more curious than defensive. Anybody here ever get defensive about like, your stance on something? You guys are not confessing to any of this stuff. <laughs> I'm like thinking maybe I'm done talking. No. <laughs> Um, she says, all the while seeking moments of togetherness. True belonging is not passive. It's not the belonging that comes with just joining a group. It's not fitting in or pretending or selling out because it's safer. It's a practice that requires us to be vulnerable, get uncomfortable, and learn how to be present with people without sacrificing who we are. I want you to hear that. <laughs> like, to hear that. It's a practice that requires us to be vulnerable and get uncomfortable. That's not easy, is it? We don't like being uncomfortable. Do you like being uncomfortable? I don't like being uncomfortable. But it's so vital to finding our way back to that connection with each other that we are willing to be vulnerable, vulnerable and get uncomfortable while not sacrificing who we are. We want true belonging, but it takes tremendous courage to knowingly walk in to hard moments. So let me ask you all a question. How many of us really enjoy uh, being yelled at? Um, being constantly questioned about your beliefs? How many of us enjoy being called names or possibly placed under one label and that's all that you are? Um, how many of us actually enjoy this political divide? Any of us enjoying it? Absolutely not. Of course we're not. You know, all of those behaviors create a contracting energy. And when we experience that contracting energy, what do we do? We pull in, right? And when we pull in, what's the danger? We separate. We separate. And so much so today that we have become an us and them culture. Really, we have become an us versus them culture, right? Right. I mean, it's okay to admit this, you guys. This is our humanness. It's okay to admit it. In fact, I think if we can't admit it, we're not going to move forward. And if you've already done this work and you're like, I love everybody no matter what they think and say, and I never get upset, I'm like, you are amazing. <laughs> but this is the journey that we're on here. Now, in this, um, in this us versus them culture, the danger is that we start seeing the others as an enemy. We see each other on opposing teams, right? We do. 
Um, now, I do believe that it's extremely important for us to come together and come to the table and talk and, again, listen to each other with the willingness to be changed by what we hear. And I am going to talk more about that next week, and I'm going to lean more into that next week. But for today, what I want to say, my friends, is we cannot wait for somebody else to change. If you're waiting for this world to get better passively, you're a part of the problem. We need to be the change that we want to see in this world today, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's not easy, and it takes effort because our habit is to go down the rabbit hole of how bad, of how awful. We awfulize a lot, don't we? And, and so it, it does take effort, and, and, but that effort is what is going to help change the dynamic in our personal lives and in the world around us. And every single one of us has the capability of bringing more love, more and more love and goodness and kindness and compassion and understanding into this world. And you know what? We do it exactly the way that Jesus told us in Luke 6, 27 and 28 where he says, love your enemies, our perceived enemies. We have perceived enemies. We don't even know these people. <laughs> We're not even in relationship with them, and yet they're our enemies. And what does he say? Love your enemies. And how do you do that? You love them by doing good to them, by blessing them, and by praying for them. And the prayer isn't, oh, Lord, help them to see the error of their ways. <laughs> help them to understand that they are way off track. <laughs> nope. <laughs> That's the ego. You pray for them as you would pray for the most beloved ones in your life. What are you praying for the people that you love? You pray that prayer for them. That is doing good to them. And that is blessing them. And it doesn't mean, my friends, like I said, that we don't take a stand for what we believe is right. It doesn't mean that at all. I'm still going to take a stand for that. But my work, our work, is to not see them as the other is to not make them wrong or bad, is to forget who they are. Because we're all children of God. We're all children of the one source. We have all come forth from the one source, right? And I think our biggest job is when somebody's showing up and you see none of that, is the willingness that you're the one, not them. You're the one that is going to be changed by praying for their best experience of life, right? Absolutely. So I thought that I would close today with the prayer that is not by St. Francis of Assisi, but is set called the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi, because <laughs> uh, St. Francis of Assisi did not actually write this prayer. And I know I've shared this prayer quite a bit, but I think it is so powerful, and it's a prayer that we can take with us. I encourage you to have this somewhere where you can see this. And if you'd like to say it with me, um, and I'm going to take it a little bit slow so we can really take it in, okay? Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Oh, let me go to the next one. Oh, divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning 
that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. My friends, we do have the ability and the capacity to be a, create a significant change in our world. Don't underestimate your individual power because as we get clearer within ourselves we create a more expansive energy right and when we create that expansive energy it goes out beyond us it goes out into our communities and it ultimately goes out into the world so your only job this week my friends is to go out and change the world <laughs> not a big deal you can do it you have what you need within you to do that very thing. And I say to you, the light and the love in me honors and celebrates the light and the love within each and every one of you. You're powerful, powerful beyond measure. Namaste. Namaste. And so as our ushers are coming forward, we have this opportunity to be in divine service to the financial well-being of Unity of Springfield. Taylor Cumberworth. Thank you, Baylor. That was excellent. So it's time for the announcements. So we, the practical prayer energy for healing will be canceled for today, and it will resume next month. Tonight we have meditation at 6 p.m., and that is open to everyone. Uh, our small groups start this week, as Sue mentioned, uh, so today is the last day to sign up. Once again, the book is Braving the Wilderness by Brene Brown. We have four people that are signed up to host, so take a look at the days and times for each of those and sign up for the one that works best for you. And as a corollary, the Navigating Grief support group will be suspended while the small groups are meeting. We will announce when they resume. So from November 1st through March 31st, we run a, co a crisis cold weather shelter. This means that when the overnight temperature is forecasted below 32 degrees, we open our doors for 25 people to come in and sleep. And we need your help. We are having a shelter volunteer meeting this Tuesday, October 15th at 6 p.m. This meeting is for current and for new volunteers. And so if you're on the fence about volunteering, please come and hear what it's all about. There's no obligation to sign up. And if you want to help but don't know what you can do, please come to this meeting. Uh, I'm going to go off here and say, listen, this is a big thing that we do, and there are so many ways to serve. You want to talk about loving your neighbor? This is how you do it right here. Please come to the meeting. Find out what you can do. Small ways, big ways, there's a place for you to help. Uh, we have a chair yoga class every Thursday at 9 a.m. Uh, this is a combination of stretching, exercise, and yoga. Everyone is welcome to attend, and the cost is $8 per session. Everyone who is attending absolutely loves it. The mat makers are meeting every Thursday at 10 a.m. This group weaves sleeping mats out of plastic bags, which are then donated to folks who are unsheltered. The mats provide a waterproof barrier, barrier between them and the ground when they sleep. Their goal is to make 100 mats in 100 days, and they would absolutely love your help. And the Unity Drum Circle meets the first and third Thursday each month. Join us this Thursday, October 10th at 6 p.m., 6.30 p.m., Bring a drum if you have one, and if not, the church has extras to borrow. And next Sunday at the 915 New Thought and World Religion Adult Education class, Mr. Paul Day will present The First Storytellers and the Hero's Adventure by Joseph Campbell. We are beginning the sixth week of our eight items in eight weeks shelter donation drive. We selected eight items, which are things we use a lot of in our cold weather shelter. The eight weeks are leading up to the start of the shelter season. Now the item for today was a cup of soups and the item for next Sunday is toilet paper. If you don't like to shop, we do have an Amazon wish list and you can order all eight items and they'll be shipped to the church. All right, announcements are good. If you will please stand and join us in our prayer for protection. Together, the light of God surrounds us, the love of God enfolds us, the power of God protects us, and the presence of God watches over us. Wherever we are, God is and all is well. 